Lake Windermere, October 16th, 1995. The British speed record for a propeller-driven boat stands at 144 miles an hour. This powerboat is here to break it. For a powerboat designer, this is the ultimate test of skill. It's a test of nerve for driver Jim Noon. The faster you go, the more unstable it becomes. It's something that you have to put out of your mind. If you are frightened of putting your foot down, then there's no point in going out there. Now, this boat is definitely going to be a winner, and what we're eventually aiming for is 150. are shaped by a simple principle. Water is 800 times denser than air, so the less a boat is submerged, the faster she will go. Boats like this, called hydroplanes, skim across the surface of the water. They're quick, but just one wave can flip them over. In 1970, this boat was a rotting hulk, sold for 50 quid, cash, to Dick Beach, a London carpenter. Dick planned to restore her as a pleasure launch, until he discovered she had a much more exciting pedigree. Built in 1909 by the Swiss yard Mejivet Piquet, she turned out to be one of the oldest racing powerboats afloat. Boats like Tags once raced all over Europe, from Bournemouth to Monaco. Winning speeds were just 20 knots, about 23 miles per hour to a car driver. Not bad for a boat that cuts through the water. Just after TAGS was launched, that boats like this were overtaken by the first hydroplanes. To begin with, a boat needed a flat bottom to plane on the surface of the water, like these First World War Royal Navy torpedo boats. On flat water, they made over 30 knots, but on choppy seas, they bounced uncontrollably. It was the last time hydroplanes would do this. But when peace broke out, the hydroplane drove wealthy Britons speed crazy. Launched in 1929, Miss England flew on air bubbles trapped behind steps in her otherwise flat-bottomed hull. Her Napier Lion aero engine generated 900 horsepower and drove her propeller at almost 7,000 revs per minute. Her cockpit was laid out like a racing car because in her pilot's wicker chair sat Major Henry Seagrave, a boy's own hero who had already smashed the world land speed record. Hurtling along at almost 90 miles an hour, Miss England won the 1930 Powerboat World Championship. A 
A lot of the glory went to her builder, the British Powerboat Company. It was founded by Hubert Scott Payne, who had just sold out of supermarine aviation. There, he had assembled the team which would go on to create the Spitfire, and his gung-ho enthusiasm touched everyone at the British Powerboat Company. As one of his coxswains remembers. We met Mr. Scott Payne most days. You knew exactly how you stood with him. He was speed all the time, you see, all the time. And when I say all the time, he didn't walk about quickly, but anything to do with boats, he was all speed. Looked to be in the first three always. Uh, and if he didn't, he would build another boat so they would get in the first three. In the early 30s, Scott Payne's need to win led to Miss Britain three a stepped hydroplane built out of metal and sheathed in lightweight aluminium. She looked like a Buck Rogers spaceship, and one journalist likened her to a silverfish on a silver platter. This time, Scott Payne himself was the pilot. When he had control, he didn't just trust blind faith. She had an engineer who was the same weight as Mr. Scott Payne. And one particular time we were on tours and he was taking ill, and I was about the same weight, so I went with him. He took off immediately. Well, if you never had a padded back, he'd break your back when she took off. She went along flat, but if, if a boat went by and she didn't ease down, she'd jerk and, you know, she'd shake me up because I wasn't used to it. That particular time we did 103. But, but I must say I was frightened. Miss Britain 3 won trophies and generated valuable publicity for the British Powerboat Company. By the 30s, Scott Payne's new Southampton boatyard employed almost 2,000 men. As well as racing hydroplanes, they made big seagoing powerboats, but too few could afford such expensive toys. Through his connections in the aircraft industry, Scott Payne met the big spending RAF. He knew that when seaplanes crashed, help often came too late. He proposed to sell them a powerboat that would rescue downed air crews in time. It was this 37-footer, launched in 1931. Her hull has angles, known as hard chines so part of her bow cuts through the water while most of her hull planes across it. It was a radical design that sacrificed some speed for stability in choppy water. Test driver Harry Banks had just one word for it. Exciting. <laughs> exciting and uh, easy, simple, but very exciting. Very sort of positive, you know. It, you put her in the in gear, she did what you expected her to do. That was the same with all her movements. She didn't fail in any way. She put the wheel over, she came over. The only thing perhaps you had to be more careful about was when it was at the sea. Then you had to nurse her just a little bit. Scott Payne welcomed the man from the RAF, who had arrived to conduct more sea trials. He alone knew this mechanic's true identity. I first met him to speak to on the jetty when he came down to go out for a trial on one of the boats, but of course didn't know who he was. He was T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, who in 1929 had changed his name and enlisted in the ranks of the RAF. Aircraftsman Shaw, we knew him, didn't say very much. He was... Uh, very strict and quiet. He'd only say one word if one word would do. He'd say yes or no, or right or left. 
Because he was always for speed, right straight away. As soon as we handed the boat over to him and he had control of it, then he would open up when he ought not to have done. Lawrence reported 30 MPH in all weathers, handy, safe. And these rescue launches were soon in service with the RAF. Within a few years, the Battle of Britain would be raging overhead, and powerboats like this would save thousands of airmen's lives. But that would only be a part of their war effort. In 1940, when Chris Dreyer was just 21, the Royal Navy gave him his first command. She was a motor torpedo boat, MTB 102. It's, it's a very special sensation to come back to, to this boat again. You always have a very special feeling for your first command. And down below, my bunk is still exactly the same as it was. But she isn't a museum. She was a houseboat for 30 years before being found by Sea Scouts. When the Sea Scouts bought it in 1973, it was in a chaotic state. And when they talked of taking it to sea, I never dreamed that that would be possible. And I visualized the Sea Scouts swimming all over the place and, and disaster. In fact, the Sea Scouts did a great job and restored a piece of powerboat history. In 1935, the British Powerboat Company created the first MTB using their angular hull. But she was a lasher. So, in 1937, when a rival yard, Vosper, built the 102 using a similar hull shape, the Navy declared her the prototype of all future MTBs. Vosper designed the 102 to run on three huge aeroplane engines, either Italian Isotta Fraschini's or the Spitfire's Rolls-Royce Merlin's. So, although lightly armed and armoured, wartime MTBs had one outstanding quality. Speed, high continuous speed, was what got you onto the enemy's convoy route unobserved and you wandered about there to look for um, ships coming through. You got as close as you could, um, unseen, and uh, endeavored to make your attack so that the enemy never knew what hit you. vital, of course, to get the hell out of it afterwards. Um, that was very important. Fighting a war at over 40 knots was not for the faint-hearted. From the moment you left harbour, there was continual spray coming over, hitting you in the face. We spent long hours trolling, sopping wet, and getting nowhere. And then suddenly there would be a bit of drama. We fought in the Channel and the North Sea and off Norway. We sank over 600 ships, which is quite formidable stuff. We lost 
60 or 70 votes. I did lose a, a good few friends, but we, we, we paid off. For the powerboat industry, the war was a boom time. Over 350 vessels were built along the lines of this Vospa prototype. Scott Payne, the pre-war pioneer, had made a killing from gunboats and anti-submarine craft. But when the fighting stopped, nobody wanted powerboats. To use up its surplus stocks of marine plywood, the British powerboat company diversified into house building. This was their show home. We've lived here for 31 years this December and it's been smashing. It's a lovely, warm, comfortable house. And just the place for the handyman. If you want to put a shelf up, uh, the walls inside and outside are wood, so it's so simple. Smaller offcuts were used to make these. They're mud shoes. But in 1946, Scott Payne shut down the British powerboat company and retired. It was the end of an era. In 1954, when powerboats returned, it was on inland water and for fun. Two retired pilots had combined the MTB hull shape with aircraft construction techniques. And this is the Mark I Albatross, all aluminium construction. It was cleverly designed. So all the sides, the curvatures, the decks and everything could be done from cold sheet. And then the whole lot laboriously riveted up, flush riveted, and then the rivets were sanded off. So the bottom is completely smooth. The bottom, the sides, the decks, completely smooth. Now, of course, this made an extremely light, strong boat. The first time I uh, went over to Albatross, the boss the first thing he did was take me out for a ride in one of the boats. I sat inside, and I'd never been in a boat like this before. And of course, I was absolutely amazed at the speed, and more amazed, actually, when he turned in probably half the width of the river. I'm mean, absolutely terrified. For the 1950s, this is way ahead of its time. Although under the bonnet was an unspectacular Ford Anglia engine. 1172 cc. 30 bhp but of course we had to do quite a bit of work on it sump the heads exhaust manifold inlet manifold header tank a special casting here to bring the filter out horizontally instead of vertically and more importantly at the front we had to rig up a thrust assembly to take the prop thrust there was no gearbox just turn the key and you are off Albatross owners began organising races. They were nice to handle. 30 mph top speed. The biggest danger in those days was for somebody coming up behind who didn't see you in the water. And then you'd probably get chopped up. By boats like this Chris Craft, a big American boat capable of over 40 miles an hour. for speed led to some bizarre inventions. This 1966 boat is powered by a jet engine. The jet star was quick but unstable. Boats came and went. But one lasting product of 60s circuit racing was the new generation of people who had been seduced by powerboats. Among them was Lady Fiona Arran. It's a real passion, and with me, always a love of speed and a love of the water. When I could get the two things together, I was away. The 
Fast Lady's first outing was in 1966 at the famous Paris six-hour race. But circuit races weren't really her cup of tea. And I suddenly discovered I was getting awfully bored going round and round in a circle and it'd be much more fun to get on the sea. And it really was. The, the first race on the sea was terrific. This powerboat won the 1969 Round Britain race. And three of the top six places were taken by Fairy Huntsman, a pioneer of the deep V hull, which skated across the water. First launched in 1960, the Huntsman was built from cold molded plywood, another aircraft construction technique. It rode easily through heavy swells and was faster than an MTB. By the 70s, deep V offshore boats were racing at up to 80 miles an hour. And if that was too slow, you went back inland. A calm lake is ideal for a record attempt, but it's a dangerous game. In 1930, Henry Seagrave died when his boat flipped over. In 1952, John Cobb died when his boat disintegrated. In 1967, Donald Campbell's boat cartwheeled backwards and his body was never recovered. At Windermere on August the 11th, 1979, Lady Aaron, by then aged 62, became the first woman to do over 100 miles an hour on water. A little spot of whiskey had to help and it was hailing, a hailstorm when we did it, and hail was coming straight into the eyes. In fact, our eyes were red when we reached the other end from the hailstorm hitting the eyeballs. And, and it was a wonderful day. Now it's Jim Noon's turn, with his attempt on the British record for a propeller-driven boat. His three-point hydroplane may look futuristic, but it's based on proven principles. Designer Ron Walbold. The less boat touching the water, the faster it's gonna go. So you try and run on those three points. That's the tips of the sponson, just the very tip, and the bottom end of the propeller. Just the, the bottom half of the propeller is all that should be in the water. That way you've got something like about, at the most, 12 square inches of wetted area. If you can get that, with 600 horsepower, you're going to go very, very quick. Jim Noon failed this time, but he will be back. Well, that was the last in the series, but you can always take a look at the book Classic Ships, Romance and Reality by Nicholas Faith, out now for £17.99.